Yes, hello. I just wanted to say, yeah, welcome to everybody, and likewise, happy Valentine's Day. Sorry that we're pulling people away from their Valentine's uh, folks, but hopefully this will be a incarnation of some feminine energy to help people. I want to say hello to Melda Galdazar. She is a uh, neat, neat lady. I had the pleasure of meeting Imelda in Zurich, Switzerland this last May. Imelda, of course, has published a, a book that I'm sure you've seen in our yeah, announcements about Emma Young called Love and Sacrifice. It is an amazing book. You know, it had a wonderful translation and it's really brought the, the first ever you know, biography you know, in English for Emma Young. We met <coughs> Imelda you know, in Zurich that time. I just want to say that uh, despite you know, her age, she was going up these hills in, in Zurich and Len and I had a, a difficult time keeping up with her on those Zurich hills. So she is a spry, energetic, just delightful, delightful lady. She of course is a Jungian analyst and has been for 30 years. She lives and practices in France and you will see the delightful spirit which she has. So we will turn it over to Imelda and you will enjoy today's conference. So all yours Imelda and thank you again for presenting to our community. So I am happy to be with you all. Some are in the morning and some are in the afternoon. We are almost evening here. And I'm very glad to be with you because I will have three occasions to discuss the topic of my book. On this first meeting, I want to introduce you, you to the process that led me to write this book. This way you will already discover how remarkable Emma Jung was. On my second talk, which will take place in April, I want to explore at a symbolic level the inner evolution of Emma Jung as her life in crisis developed. On a third presentation in June, I might attempt a parallel at the archetypal level of Emma's situation in her time and that of the African women of today, the way I met them in Tanzania. First, I want to stress the fact that dates have been very important in the process of approaching Jung's life, Emma Jung's life. Those dates served as guiding beacons because in retrospect, they did allow me to keep track of my whereabouts and my goals. As you will discover, I was not always aware of conscious or conscious of where my intuition and circumstances were taking me or where they lead me. Along the way, many synchronicities or major events paved my way. So let's start by the beginning. In November 2004, an American friend named John Cerullo sent me the June Jung biography, which we see here which has been written by Deirdre Bear. At the time, the book received a National Book Award, and James Hollis, reviewing it in the Houston Chronicle, wrote, it will stand as the most comprehensive and unbiased of the biographies produced over the four decades since Jung's death, which means that it's an important book. However, we know that some members of the Jung's hair express very negative criticism of this important book because of unavoidable errors. As far as I'm concerned and with passion, I immersed myself in the reading of this impressive book. The 600 pages were offering in great details accounts of Jung's life of his time his work, his followers. I also carefully read the 200 pages note. When I the, reached the end of my reading, something struck me as incredible. How come that nothing has ever been written about Emma Jung? Suddenly, the fate of this woman appears so harsh and so unfair. Whenever I mention this fact, even today, it moves me. Because as of today, I strongly feel that it has been an outrage made toward Emma Jung. 
it lasted not only during young lifetime, but during all those decades that followed. The attempt to explore the delicate story of the marital situation of Jung toward his wife had always been swept under the rug. Sharing my reaction with friend led me to question my feelings. Should I write about Emma and how? A friend suggested that I first read a book written about Mrs. Freud. But very soon I realized that Emma Jung had a far more brilliant personality than Mrs. Freud and that the approach to Emma Jung ought to be different. Then, in 2005, some dreams start filling my nights. Under the cover of symbolic images, Emma Jung began to impose herself to my attention. One dream was taking place near a well, Another dream had foreseen the proximity of the underground. Those two dreams came to my help, and I'll tell them. In the first one, I'm standing by a well, and I'm busy brushing uh, some dead leaves which cover it. Suddenly, a beautiful fish surged from the depth. As this gold and silver fish appears, I'm filled with amazement and admiration. Then he vanishes from my sight. I have the instant feeling that it is a symbolic sign coming from Emma Jung. It expresses the need to bring her out of the depth of the unconscious. A few days later, I have another dream. This time, I'm seated at a round table of a Parisian cafe located near the entrance of a subway. Suddenly, like in the previous dream, I see this time a beautiful goose emerge from the underground stairway. She seems rather surprised and disoriented. She looks in my direction and then disappears. There again, I have the strong feeling that it is a sign that is coming from Emma Jung. It is a request to bring her out of the shadows world. Needless to say that I was moved by those two archetypal dreams. We know that the round well, like the round table of the cafe, are images of mandala. It's a symbol of totality and wholeness. The well is a link between the conscious and the unconscious. So is the open staircase leading to and from the underground. The fish is a symbol of transformation. The goose is a symbol of realization and completeness because this animal is able to live on earth, in the water, and in the air. The goose is also a symbol of fidelity. This dream seemed clear to me. Both were expression of Emma's demand. In order to accomplish her final journey in the other world, she needed an official recognition. It was both impressive and sobering to enter in a relationship with a person who had been gone for such a long time. Emma Jung had died in 1955, 40 years had passed. I could not escape the feeling that she was trying to reach me in a very powerful manner. Still, not to let myself be caught, be caught in some delusion, I told my dreams to a few friends and some close colleagues. Everybody agreed that those dreams were a message that should not be overlooked. So I was finally convinced. By the middle of 2005, I start another beacon and began searching the subject of Emma Jung version back. I want to express here once more my gratitude toward Deirdre Bear. Through her 10 years of exploration of different fonts and archives, she had gathered an impressive amount of information. 
she had also interviewed many people and she had even met uh, Agatha, the eldest daughter who was still alive. Those links led me naturally to Emma. There were thin threads, but they guided me through my own investigation. Unhappily, having no knowledge of German language, I was denied the access to some material related to Emma. But mostly, I had to admit that there was not much material available. I also made an attempt to approach the Jung Stiftung, but I knew that they were in no mood to let anything out for a research which had not received their approval. Still, I moved along my secret way till 2007. Then, in July 2007, saw me in Zurich to attend a Jungian conference. I used this occasion to go to Kusnacht and ask if I could meet Andreas Jung. We know that Andreas Jung, the architect and grandson of Carl Gustav Jung, still lives in the Seestrasse house and is often welcoming the crowd coming to visit the house. So we made an appointment and I met him. I was rather timid and bold. I told him that after many reflections, I had the intention to write a book about the grandmother Emma Jung. I was received by a very calm but clear refusal. It's impossible because her grandmother always wanted to remain in the shadow. I told him that I respect his opinion, but for personal reason, I would go along with my project. I realized then that this issue of Emma Jung was extremely sensitive. The very night I returned from Zurich, that July 2007, I had the strangest dream. In this dream, I was receiving an SMS on my newly bought cell phone, which I still have. On this message, it was written, you have to tell them that I suffered a lot. And the message was signed, Emma. I can tell you that when I recall this surprising event, I still feel a strong emotion. We know how emotion are a manifestation of the unconscious. To me, this dream was an impressive, luminous event. I must add that in front of my calm determination, the Jung family slowly changed attitude and finally opened the door. I want to express my gratitude once more for their generosity. It came as a proof that in spite of the difficulties, I had no other choice but to pursue the sensitive project. So six months later, one early morning of 2008, I wrote down the table of contents. It imposed itself. I guess the time was right, and I started writing. It took me two years to do it. On several, on several occasions, I even traveled to Zurich. The purpose was to meet as many people as possible to visit place and to gather again some documents. It helped me bring together the physical and geographical aspect of Emma's life. Under the guidance of Just Herney, I visit the Schaffhausen, Emma's hometown. I also visit Erlberg, her adolescent home, which is still in the family. I even went to the Bollingen Tower and early later on, I was introduced in the Burgholzli. Those visits were very meaningful and helpful moments. They allowed me to feel Emma version back. We were even privileged, my husband and I, to meet twice with Lil, Helen, the last surviving daughter of the couple. She was gen then aged over 90, and today she she's deceased at 100. 
it was clear from that visit that the children were, were very close to their mother and were very aware of her personality. My conviction grew slowly that in a mysterious way, which I did not control, this writing was commissioned by Emma Jung herself. I kept having dreams. On occasion, I even had a strong feeling that Emma was leaning over my shoulder. I was even wondering if I was not simply her scream. There were even manifestations of Carl, but he was not always satisfied. But it didn't prevent the process to move on. Then, in September 2010, Emma Jung, analyst et écrivain, was published in French by a Swiss publisher located in Lausanne and which is called L'Age d'Homme. In this process, I could say that an important beacon had been posted. To promote the, the book, I gave lecture. I was even introduced at the French speaking radio in Lausanne. Then, Many English-speaking colleagues, friends or readers told me that it would be important to have a, an English translation of the book. A new task would fall on me. For a few months, I was very reluctant. Was I ready to set another beacon? Where would it lead me? Did it make sense? A French even gave me the address of a translator. I finally wrote to this woman who was unknown to me. And as I was contacting her, she told me that she had had dreams about me. So from July 2011 through most of 2013, I worked hand in hand with Kathleen, a professional translator. It was a new experience. It forced me to clarify a certain element of the French book. In some way, it was like giving birth again to my child. Karen publication accepted the manuscript and the book was released in September 2014. Ten years had passed since my first encounter with Emma Jung while I was reading Jung biography. My way had been paved with many synchronicities. Last but not least, this past January 2015, as I was preparing the text for this webinar, I received a letter from Just Herney, one of the sons of the now deceased Helen, their mother. This letter contained the original necrology announcement for Emma Jung, and it contained also the eight page eulogy which were delivered by the pa by a pastor during the religious ceremony held in November 30, 1955 in the temple of Kusnacht. This gesture by the Herney family moved me. I felt that it came as the closing of the full circle which had led me through the complex exploration of Emma's life. It was a recognition of my role that I had accepted to play to free Emma Jung from the dark well or the anonymous underground, those images which had been the one she had expressed herself through my dreams. Ten years had passed. It is important to mention those beacons. In a mysterious way, they comfort my occasional doubts and escorted my creation. While one is creating, there is this combination of the objective work of writing and a mysterious subjective evolution. This complex fabric produces synchronicity. When I state that Emma Jung followed my process, I'm, I'm, I am convinced today that this book was published to meet an ontological need. The need was for Emma to be pulled out of the shade where she had been kept for too long. The silence around her had created an odd situation that was waiting on Jung's family in a very subtle way. To my 
humble conviction, I reached the conclusion that after all this time, the fear was still that the revelation could taint Jung's image. Revealing Emma's complex story had finally allowed the family to openly acclaim how this woman had been the heart of the family life. Her full image was duly restored. I even think that Emma's story helps highlight many aspects of her special time in passing of Carl Jung's own evolution. Somebody wrote, it gives flesh to Jung. Somebody says, for once, Jung is not occupying the, fr the front seat. Many people ask, what would have happened to Jung if Emma had divorced? It is a, fre a frequent question. It's also interesting, but we'll come back to that maybe later, that some works play on books related to Emma Jung started appearing while I was in the process of writing. If we have time, I'll enumerate them. Almost 50 years have passed since Emma Jung's death in November 1955. 50 years is often the time required for the opening of secret archives. So now, I suggest that we move one step further and enter in Emma Jung's life. Let me first share a reflection. As soon as I discovered Emma, it occurred to me that there was a mysterious connection to be made between Emma Jung and the fascinating myth of Odysseus. Ulysses' wife, Penelope, is presented as the paramount of love, devotion, stability, faith, and determination. Penelope, in the myth, holds a central position. She is the personification of the earth from where one lives and where to one returns. It is also easy to compare Carl Jung with Ulysse and his many exploration. Making the association between Penelope and Emma Jung became clear. Through the events that crossed Emma's existence, one thing finally prevailed. Emma had succeeded without wavering to maintain the family earth stable. She had also reached a very high level of individuation. In my imagination, Emma deserved to join the ranks of the mythic heroines. It made no doubt that it was the result of Emma's solitary struggle to accept surmount and transform her husband's will and decision to introduce a woman in their intimate life for 30 years. And he had remained deaf to his wife's play and request during all that time. Based on this conviction, the next question was, how should I tell her story? To be fair to Emma, it did seem interesting to intertwine the different aspects of her life. On the one hand, there would be the rather linear dimension of her life as a woman of her time and of her milieu. On the other hand, exploring the labyrinthic development of her inner life would be central. Both, both aspects are illustrated in three pictures of Emma Jung rushing back taken at different time and stretching 50 years. As we look at the lovely picture of Emma as a young bride, what dominates at first sight is the charm of a young socialite who enters married life in a rather formal and comfortable manner. Taken from a social viewpoint, Emma had a privileged childhood. She was born in an affluent industrial family. She was part of the emerging new bourgeoisie. Looking at the other two pictures, which will come back maybe later on, 
you see the change in Emma's life and Emma's, in Emma's appearance, of course. But the young girl we mentioned here tells the story of a, an adolescent who, in spite of a comfortable life, watched her father health decline due to an increasing blindness. So, as a young girl, she had to take charge of a responsibility of an adult. It is probably one of the reasons that led to Emma's reputation as being a very serious and rather introverted young woman. She was naturally studious and more interested in natural science than in girlish pursuits. But still, she was denied the possibility of enjoying a higher education that made no sense to her father. Instead, she was offered the possibility to spend a year in Paris within the cultural environment of some family's friend. While in Paris, she was probably exposed to the, for the first time to the French text by Christian de Troyes about the legendary Quête du Graal. Emma, young years were at the antipode of Karl's. It is obvious that Karl did not belong to the Rosenbach social world. Financially, the young man had to struggle to make ends meet while studying medicine in Basel. He was partly living on a scholarship. But he had already made a reputation for himself as a very bright, passionate psychiatric student exploring new approach in mental life. We have the impressive story told by Carl Jung himself visiting at Ulberg. As a medical student, he was then 23. He observed the 16-year-old Emma, who had made a very short appearance on her family home staircase. As he saw her, he, he instantly felt that she would become his wife. He tells the story in his memory book. He bluntly shared this feeling with his friend, who did not fail to question his certitude. It's interesting to know that Emma's mother, with some mysterious foresight, is the one who, from the start, made possible for Carl to meet her daughter and eventually to encourage Emma to accept becoming his wife. We know that in the eyes of her father, Carl didn't represent the best choice as a husband. All this element did wait in young Emma's choices. Carl failed to meet the criteria of this modern bourgeoisie, but seemingly his passion finally gained Emma's heart. Let's mention in passing that Berta Rosenbach, Emma's mother, had a strong personality and would lead a long and active life after her husband's early death. So, in February 1903, Carl and Emma were married. Emma's marriage brought a radical change to her life. After their honeymoon, Emma and Carl moved for a very short while in Old Zurich. But most importantly for Emma, leaving Schaffhausen for Zurich meant moving away from the large family mansion to a modest apartment within the confines of the Burgosli. Here we see the house of Ulberg, which was a very big kind of a fantastic house that the father had wanted to build. Then they moved to the psychiatric center of Burgosli, from which we see two pictures. This center has hardly changed at the time, it was outside of Zurich and fenced. Today, of course, the malls are, are gone, but the buildings are almost unchanged. And from the facade, we can see the view of where the Jung family settled on the second floor. Actually, Jung's office was on the main floor. We can visit 
the Burgosli, which I did, and it's very impressive to see that those buildings have hardly changed. Of course, now they are part of Zurich, and the walls are not there anymore. But it was very difficult to move in an apartment which was really located on the same level as where the sick people were living. So beside a normal love life, the move was the beginning for Emma and Carl of a very close scientific relationship. It really met Emma's aspiration for whom reading and studying always had a preference. The house chores would never be Emma's forty. It's also important to bear in mind that Carl, throughout his life, would always involve his wife in his research, his reflection, his doubt, and his conflict. It was certainly a privilege for Emma to be exposed to Jung's idea regarding his revolutionary approach, which dealt with the psyche and its pathologies. From her linear viewpoint, as well as in regard in her evolution, her marriage to Carl was to bring major changes in her life. It's not surprising that friends who were close to the couple gave this testimony that Emma's marriage to Carl had changed her deeply. Carl had married a young wealthy bourgeoise, but he had also encountered a young woman whose interests were many and tuned mostly to the pleasure of learning. For Carl, Emma was a woman endowed with a strong mind and a set of moral value. She would prove to be open, adaptable and faithful, but it didn't prevent her from expressing strong disagreement with some of her husband's choices and decisions. During the Bugosli years, many events would affect Carl and Emma's life. In 1905, Emma's father died. Between 1904 till 1910, four children were born to the couple. It is meaningful to mention the pride of Jung, then 33, when he announced to Freud in an elated letter, and I quote, now I can die because I have a son. Franz, their only son, was born in 1908. The first couple turmoil was created by the arrival of Sabina Spielrein in 1906 in the confines of the Burgosli. A lot has been written about the confrontation between Jung and Sabina, between Emma and her husband, but also between Emma, Freud and Jung. A dangerous method very skillfully exploit the potential complexity of this situation. For Emma, we can say that it was a terrible shock. Then, in 1907, a first and inaugural encounter between Freud and Jung took place. This inaugural meeting, as we all know, would stimulate the psychoanalytical movement. If I mention it, it's because it's important to say that Emma, throughout the whole time, would enjoy a very confident relationship with Freud. She found in this elder man a father figure which she had missed. She was also an active member of the different events that were to mark the intense years of Freud and Jung collaboration. The rare letters by Emma Jung that survived are precisely those she wrote to Jung. They bring uh, to Freud, I'm sorry. <laughs> they bring to light Emma's modesty, her generosity, her intelligence, her suffering, her doubt, and her affection for Freud. Those letters also reveal Emma's fierce defense of her husband's ideas. I think they are very interesting to read, and I recommend you to do it. They are, an, they are only six or seven letters. Freud had spoken of Emma as the solver of riddles. As the friction were growing between the two men, 
Emma intervened with diplomatic skills. She attempted in rare letters to appease Freud. She was suggesting that it would be helpful for him to abandon his father figure complex toward Jung in order to create a more equal relationship. This attempt was daring and courageous, but proved to be useless. It is in 1911, during their early years in Kusnacht, that Jung published his first major work, Symbols of Transformation. We know that this important book would slowly cost Freud's friendship. The potential here was daring to open new alleys of thought in spite of their passionate friendship and reciprocal admiration it would be unacceptable to the master. We also learn from Jung himself how Emma positioned herself in that situation. We find that in the fourth word of the fourth Swiss edition of Symbols of Transformation, which came out in 1950, Jung then mentioned the tension that this book had created in 1911, and he writes, I was acutely conscious then of the loss of friendly relation with Freud and of the loss of companionship of our work and collaboration together. The practical and moral support which my wife gave me at that time and at, the different, at, the, at this difficult period is something I shall always hold in grateful remembrance. In writing that, Carl offered a public gesture to Emma Jung, who is then almost 70. At the time of this major rift between Freud and Jung, Emma was only a young woman of 29. There again, we are witnessing the central role played by Emma in supporting Carl's hardship. We all know how this unavoidable separation would affect each of those two giants. Late in life, Jung acknowledged how this split with Freud had generated for him a lifelong suffering. We also know that this rupture led eventually Carl to the major experience which he would call his confrontation with the unconscious. This experience would affect deeply the couple as well. In the linear dimen uh, dimension of the Jung's life, it's important to say that the family changed habitat and moved from Le Burgolsi in 1910 to the family house, which was called the house by the lake, which was a gracious and large mansion allowed by Emma Smone. We can see the picture of the, maybe, the Kusnacht house. What can we turn to the beautiful book written and illustrated part by Andreas Jung, which tells the story of this house. The move to Kusnacht house was important and welcome for many reasons. Jung Carey was blossoming. He had overgrown his position as a subordinate to Professor Bleuler at the Brugolsky. They now had a large family needing more breathing space. We can say that both Emma and Carl need both space for each, each one. They need to expand their family talent. And we have here this beautiful family picture, which was taken in 1915. The youngest child, Helen, is a year old and it does not appear in this picture. But each person expressed many aspects of their personality. Carl wore his walking, hiking shoes as well as France and maybe the little girl seated next to the mother whose name is Marianne. We have the two other girls whose name is 
Agatha, and the other one is, <laughs> I forget the name, uh, Agatha, and uh, he sh she had the same name as uh, Emma's sister. I'm sorry, I forget the name now. It's also interesting to mention that during the family life chapter in the book, we are going to hear about the introduction of Tony Wolf in the family circle, but primarily in Carl's life. We'll explore in depth the outcome of this painful trauma in Emma existence during the next webinar. Love and Sacrifice is the chosen title for the, Emma, the American translation of my book. In a clear way, it attempts to summarize the trial that would be Emma's lot for over 30 years. Somehow, it's the substantial part of the book. We must remember that the, the SMS dream message of Emma that I had received in 2007 was saying, you have to tell them that I suffer a lot. In a complex way, the book task was to give flesh to this dramatic dream. The strategy in telling Emma's life was to mesh together the different threads of her life giving way to her social position in this young 20th century was important. Emma was what part of a unique time, and we know that this time would revolutionize the way we looked at our mental and psychic life. In a special environment, this woman, Emma, by her discreet and stable position, would be always central. The way Emma grew up had nourished her mind. It would help her in due time. She had experienced the suffering of, fa of her father. It had forced her to mature quickly. This experience would help her face another critical situation that would come her way. As she told it herself, Emma's situation was one of solitude. She could not confine, confide in anyone because she said she was Carl's wife and was at the center of that microcosm. It added greatly to the weight of her life. Emma felt this reality as an extreme pressure to remain whole and to preserve her own self. The amazing dimension of Emma Young is that she proved capable of handling alone a lifelong crisis that nowadays would send us to a helpful psychoanalyst and to create dramatic outbursts, not to say desperate outcomes. On the other hand, from the start, Emma Young was closely and actively associated with the growing woods of Freud psychoanalysis and Jung analytical psychology. She was part of the first inner circle who shared Jung every new ventures. So she was familiar with Jung concept and work. Therefore, Emma Jung was naturally prepared to enter herself the field of psychotherapy. As we read her story, we learn that she became a very skillful analyst. Jung did compare her to a dog. We must also remember that the seed of the quest of the grail had been planted during her youth years. But Emma's many tasks as wife, mother, hostess, therapist, teacher, president, kept her willingly, but too often away from her research. She attuned herself to the responsibility of helping the community and their many tasks. We know that people 
from many parts of the world visited Kushnacht. They came from Germany, Great Britain, Holland, the Americas. All these people, mostly women, were eager to discover the meaning of the unconscious according to Jung and to explore it through a personal experience. So Emma was the one who would care to many confused people. She would also assume the social function required by the studies. So at the end, it prevented her from publishing her work on the grade. No wonder that sharing Jung's life was for Emma a very exciting and stimulating experience, but it was never an easy one. For this reason and other more secret ones, it seems obvious that leaving Jung did not appear as being a valid option. Nowadays, we would question that so such a choice. In time, in the process of writing this book, I felt as a silent witness to Emma or to the couple's evolution. Through dreams and synchronicities, I would have a clear feeling of what was right to, to write or keep to myself. It was a very mysterious experience. I could even compare this experience with the process going on during a therapeutic relationship. Throughout our intuition and the unconscious interconnection, we are led to discover some of our patient's subtle situation. We develop a vision of their potential and even an image of the self. In a way, writing the story of Emma Jung faced me often with those very delicate situations. We also know that evoking someone's life can never be an objective work. I made the experience as I interviewed some of Emma's children, grandchildren. Throughout the expression of their souvenirs, I discovered different aspects of their grandmother. Of course, none of them could certify that they really knew who she was. They each had own specific feeling about her, had some specific experience with her. They each revealed some aspect of the rich kaleidoscope of this woman. I was bound to put together the piece of the puzzle. If the emotion had the, the echo of the soul, I can say that I had many echoes of Emma's complex soul. We know that Emma wrote some very interesting books, an essay on anima and another one on animus. She also gave many interesting lectures, and of course she taught at the Institute. And one of the first lectures, which I will probably come back in the next webinar, is the lecture she gave at the Young Psychological Club of Zurich in 1916. At that time, Emma Jung is age 34. The title of this lecture is Schuld. It can be translated by guilt or personal responsibility toward oneself. This lecture lifts a corner of the veil of what is at the core of Emma's life with the presence of Tony Wolf in their own intimate relationship and the consequence on her life. Emma Jung reflections also open the door to the work awaiting each one of us as we meet our own psychological complex. Somehow, Emma Jung pioneers the technical analytical, analytical, analytical technique. The end of Emma's story offers a vision of a mellowing couple. Their common life of 50 years has taken them through many joys and as many trials. And we see here the picture that was chosen to illustrate Emma's life. It might seem strange because we don't see only Emma, but we see both. 
In a subtle way, it expresses how Emma has reached her inner self and is ready to leave her husband. Her tender smile expresses both love and maybe a sort of compa compassion. Actually, this picture was taken a year before Emma's, Emma's death. Naturally, the book speaks of Carl Jung's own experience too, because in a way, does the book mention also the building of the Bollingen Tower? We also read about Carl's heart attack. This shared event have allowed us to highlight how Emma had lived and faced those pleasant, difficult and extreme situations. Seemingly, we had to wait all that time to heal the wounds that, has be, that had been the fate of Emma's life. But the possibility to speak out the truth had become unescapable. And I discovered that after, okay, there we have this picture, and I think it's very interesting because in a way, it goes back to the dream where Emma was telling that we had to take her out of the well through the image of the fish. Here we have a woman, and it linked to a very scandalous story that took place in France at the beginning of the 20th century. I discovered this painting lately, and I thought that it was very interesting to put it in relationship with uh, the dramatic situation of Emma's life. So finally, I can say that I had some subtle confirmation that my work had answered Emma Jung's request. Needless to say that Emma Jung had become quite close to me through that process. Walking along the complex path taken by her inner and outer existence created a sort of connivance between us. I must thank her for this privilege. Now I can, if you want, if we have time before the question, I don't know, I can maybe name some of the work, book or plays who appeared lately starting in 2007 Elizabeth Clark's town, uh, Clark's town did create a play called Out of the Shadow of Tony Wolf. So maybe now that we are going to move to... Okay, yes. Ryan. Yes, we, uh, we definitely have time for you to go into those details right now. So I'll just uh, let you continue on and I'm going to start collecting some questions. So folks, if you have any questions, please do send them in via the chat feature, the question feature, or you can email them in. Um, but I'll let you uh, continue on, Imelda. Which picture? But, pardon? Oh, which... There is a picture that you want to see? Oh, um, only if you wanted to bring one up. I was just telling folks to send in their questions if they had them. Um, okay. So I was going right. to let you go on with uh, her books. Okay. Alors, chérie, euh, qu'est-ce que tu me dis là um, Ok, so, the different work that came out, there is also, of course, The Dangerous Method, the movie that came out in 2011. There is a play that was created in Paris in 2008 about uh, Sabina Spielrein and Jung. And I know that in April 2015, there will be a book coming out uh, uh, around Emma Jung. And we heard that finally, the Jung family is starting to make research on Emma Jung, their great-grandmother, because it's a great-grandson who is a historian who is going to work on that. So in a way, it was really time to go to Emma Jung's life. 
Is there something else which I didn't mention that I speak of? Je suis étonné qu'on n'a pas notre. You know, I think it's inter interesting also to mention that Emma's Emma Young eulogy, which which was given November 30, 1955, confirm in a way whatever has been written in the book. However, it's interesting to know that Emma's experience are really brushed with a, a very light pen. At that time, in 1955, many facts could not be shared openly and, you know, even uh, give account of. So it, it means that 50 years have really gone by before we could say that Emma Young had been totally recognized as having played a central role in Jung's life. I'm the conviction today that without Emma Jung, Jung himself would not have survived. And that's why we can say, and we might come back to that, that divorcing Carl Gustav Jung seemed to have been an impossible thing to do. Of course, many people say, how come? Because it was so unfair to her. But I think there are some deepest link that exists between the two of them which prevent that thing to happen and we'll probably go back to that on the other webinar especially the second one when i will share with you you know Sibolikui or emma went through the trial of having to cope with the situation of tony wolf being in their life for so many, so many years. Actually, Tony Wolf died in 1953 at the age of 64. She was younger than Emma Jung, of course, and she died mostly from a heart attack, seemingly very peacefully on the first day of the spring of 1953. In a way, 1955 seems to be a long time ago, and still, as I look at myself being over 80, Emma Young could have been my grandmother. And that's probably one of the reasons it was easy for me to relate to Emma Young. In some other way, I had some common points with Emma Young because I did belong, in a way, to the same kind of social environment as, as Emma Young. I also have, we also have a large family. So there were common points, but there is still the mystery of why did Emma Jung ask me to share her story and to, co to communicate it to a wide public. So I don't know if I'm still on, I guess. Okay. Oh, yes, but... <laughs> you're still on. <laughs> um, I did get a couple of questions in. Um, I'll start with one where we have someone is asking about the picture of the woman coming from the well. Um, she asks if the picture is included in the book. I don't believe it is, but could you give a little more um, information on the picture where people might be able to find it and find more information about it? Yes, actually uh, it's a painting from a painter from the early uh, 20th century, 19, 19, 1890 and 90, uh, we shall say. And it's very interesting because there was a scandal at that time about a Jewish military who had been uh, criminalized wrongly. And after many years, he was finally freed. And the paint, some painters and some writers took side for Dreyfus. His name was Dreyfus. And that took place in the beginning of the 20th century. And I thought it was very interesting because on the, if you look at the, pic, at the painting, the woman is getting out of the well and she's retained by two people and one person is a priest and another one is a military. So in a way, like Emma Jung somehow, many people didn't want to let her out, 
you know, she wanted to remain in the shadow. That's why I think it, in a way, it's a very interesting painting. I can even give the, the, the author. The painter is called Deva Ponsant. Actually, um, he was living in this region. He was living in Tours, actually. So he's really somehow he's a local painter. And I was very thrilled to see this picture because I really thought it was a synchronicity T talking about Emma who was taken out of the well and taken out of the underground that the painting was showing how important and this woman was really fighting her way from those who wanted to, to keep her silent somehow. So I think, you know, it's impressive to know that it took 50 years for Emma Jung to be recognized as such an important person. Did, did that answer the question? And um, uh, just my personal question, do you think that it was Emma's intention to stay in the shadow or do you think that it was more um, the family wanting to not have her be sort of um, in this main story of Carl Jung, the, you know, kind of leave her portion out of his uh, accomplishments um, to not, sh you know, shed darkness onto his legacy. Do you think that that may have um, been it or do you think that she truly did want to let Carl Jung take the spotlight and her be the supportive um, wife? Well, I think that the, 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 I don't know how Jung himself felt about that, but, and it's written in the book, but after uh, Jung death, I guess, not Emma's death, but Jung death. Some people said that Emma Jung had to be a very special person to be able to stand such a terrible situation. And I think that the triangular relationship, because at the time Jung was even, they were talking about Tony as being his second wife. So I think for the family afterwards, that was a cause of some scandal and nobody would even dare to mention that. Because as I say, after so many years, they were afraid that it would taint Jung image. So in a way, I think that that's why writing the book, Carl interfered in some dreams and he was not happy with what was taking place. So I think that even after death, which is really surprising, this situation is still waiting and has been waiting for so long in the Jung family. Of course, we have to remember that it took place in the 20th century, that they are, it's a Swiss German family, and all that really made things much more sensitive than it probably would nowadays. Right, I agree. And we've got a, a quick follow-up question on the same sort of topic. Um, what does it reveal about Emma's development as a person that she saw fit to serve a larger movement of analytical psychology than the more limited objective of marriage fidelity in a conventional marriage? Well, I think that Emma Jung took advantage of her position as the wife of Carl Gustav Jung. And because she was such an intelligent and open per personality, I think really she was interested in psychology at the first, in, in the first term. And I think on her own, she really create a work and a the way of being an analyst was really something which was really her own task and her own talent. And I think that in many ways she did disagree with Jung, but also having Jung having such a strong personality, I think she always had to negotiate, you know, how far she could go and how much he, he would take. But the children, and Helen told us that, that she was very bold toward him sometimes and that she probably was the only one who would really dare to tell him 
when he was wrong, which is very impressive. So she was probably one of his main counsels if she was one of the only people to be able to speak her true mind to him, give him 100% um, honest feedback. Uh, she must have played an immense, immensely huge role in his livelihood. Um, well, yes, I think that in a way she was a very, because of the way she grew up, you see, I think she learned to be very independent in mind, you know. But also, we have to remember, and it's very unique in a way in the story of many of those giants, you know, when we hear about Einstein and others, the fact that she remained faithful to Jung and that he kept her, we know that every time she and Emma Jung made an attempt to stay away from him, something happened to him. <laughs> he became ill or he had some trouble. So there is a very mysterious, I would say, unconscious connection between those two people and I'm sure that the fact that Jung had to stay five years by himself after Emma's death mm -hmm. was a reason for him to repay something to Emma and that's probably why the stone that he engraved is such a beautiful hymn at Emma's love, you know. Absolutely. And that's something Yes, some, but you know, I think the personality of Jung was such that I say like Ulysses, you know, the Odysseus, nothing would keep him from doing what he felt was right for him. In a way, he was probably very egoistic or narcissistic, which Emma was not. But anyway, at the end, if she accepts to suffer as much as she has had the pleasure of enjoying the proximity after all she was his she was his wife you know and that was a privilege i think the more that i hear about emma she was brilliant beyond uh, my original knowledge of her I, I did not realize that she um did uh or partook in analytical psychology that she saw patients that she could have even written uh books on it um, been published and she wasn't able to. I couldn't imagine Carl going his last five years without that. She must have been, you know, his his soulmate to be there to discuss with him, to help him hone his ideas. Um, brilliant. She, she was extremely Definitely smart. so. Definitely so. And I think that's why, you know, it's such a shame that for so long she was not recognized. And even uh, the documents that were kept at the psychological club had never been exploited and I was, I'm was i the one who discovered them. So suddenly when I started being interested in Emma Jung, there was first this strong objection. But then suddenly be, people became interested in Emma Jung. And I think that it's just fair. And I'm sure that many more things will probably come out and probably that many work will be published and translated in English, I hope so. Because none of them, well, of course, uh, the essay on anima and animals have been translated both in English, in French, in Italian. But very few of her work remain completely unknown to the public. And she played such a central role because she was the first president of the Psychological Club in Zurich in 1916. She's really the one who started this group. And she was the vice president of the Jungian Institute in Kusnacht as well. So she really occupied a central place. But that was the difficult situation. Maybe she also felt that her husband had to have the first place. Nobody knows. But I think they exaggerate uh, the relationship. Also, it's important to know that Emma was a very introverted person. She never looked for the first, you know, to be put to the front, to the front place. That's I know too. Hey, Nora, I have a question. I hate, hate to butt in if I'm stepping on any other questions that are there, but the Jungian psychology has such a balance of masculine and feminine, yeah, within it. The Mysterium Conjunctionis and the 
uh, well, to all the principles of, of the different polarities. Do you see Emma Young as that kind of balance with the feminine uh, in opposition to the, the masculine and her somehow being a crucial role in, in that kind of you know, within the, the couple, the two? Well, you know, I think that Jung himself has a very strong and conscious relationship with the anima. This mm -hmm. is the reason why he probably had those women's experience, you know, actually. Uh, I think that both, and we have to recognize that, both Emma and Tony Wolf and other women were really in connection with Jung own feminine component because I think that Jung in a way and that's why so many women came first before the man because his approach to the psyche to the depth of the psyche when he says that the depth of the psyche is really the material the maternal you know warmth I think the feminine aspect of the psyche is so basic and so important and linked to the intuition, for instance. And we know that Jung was, had this function of intuition. So I think that Emma, in a way, could not but agree with the way you approach the psyche and mm. the feminine aspect of the psyche. But Jung had it too, in a way. And I think Emma represent part of the feminine psyche for Jung, but I think it did need other women to represent the other aspect of his own feminine dimension, you know, an unconscious feminine uh, dimension is in his own psyche. So that's why, in a way, writing the way he did was an expression of his developing this feminine psyche which was really at the depth of his psychology to start with. Is that mm -hmm. clear? Yeah, 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 that makes sense. I mean, it's such a powerful part of, of Jungian psychology yeah, as well with that. I've, yeah. got a very, <clears throat> I've got a very interesting comment right here. Um, yeah, go ahead, I can ask mine later. Marion Tauber said that it is also, or it also took some 50 years for Jung's Red Book to come out, and both instances between this book and the Red Book were allowed profound insight into the Jung lives, um, you know, of Emma and Carl. Uh, very interesting that 50 years for each. Yes, mm. yes, mm -hmm. this is true too. Yes, yes, I know Marianne Tauber, and she's a very interesting woman. Did, repeat again what she said. She said that the Red Book took 50 years to be published as well. Um, <laughs> and it's very interesting that each book took 50 years for the uh, yeah. truth to yeah. come out and how they both gave a profound insight into their lives. But you know, I think it, when I say that 50 years is a time where secret archives are usually open, I think that in a way, um, the Jung family pushed it as far as they could but I'm, I'm sure, but we not, I'm not aware of that myself, but I'm sure there have been unconscious pressures, pressure uh, for whom I don't know, you know, to force the family to open that. But, you know, there is always, and I heard that from some of the grandchildren, they are very, how could I say, they don't trust the public opinion toward Jung. They are, all, they are very resentful of the way people would be looking at Jung or would be critical of Jung. That's why when I started uh, re researching, they were really very critical. First of all, they were very critical of Deirdre Bear because she was telling truth. But some truths are still today unacceptable for the Jung's hair. I'm sure of that. It's very um, delicate to say so, but I know it is the truth. So mm -hmm. in a way, 50 years in the time that was, I would say, acceptable, but I think it was not acceptable to keep it longer. At least Emma Jung is the one who requested it, 
because seemingly I'm not the one who took the responsibility to write the book, Emma Young did. And in a way, it's very mysterious. But um, that's the only truth I can say. That's why dates, to me, are so important, because they are really like beacons, you know, telling facts after facts and the way that Emma wanted to be to be really revealed to the public and, you know, uh, liberating her from a place which was which was really un irrelevant to her. I think she had to occupy the place that she deserved at the first place, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, the question I had is kind of a follow-up to that of so many years going past before you know, your biography you know, came out and then this other book you know, coming out you know, in pretty close you know, proximity you know, to that. Do you have any thoughts, Melda, on either the synchronistic elements to that or why, why now the, these two you know, very important you know, pieces are, are coming together, uh, also in close conjunction with the Red Book? Wasn't that long ago that the Red Book came out? Any thoughts on why now and how the, these two pieces you know, come forward? But I think that all those are synchronicities to me, you know. They are not only synchronicities, I think they are numinous events. I think in a way they really talk directly to our unconscious and to they go to the collective unconscious as well, I think. And I think that because we have entered the way, the time, when it is so urgent that we go back, you know, to our unconscious and that bring it, we bring it to our conscious part, I think that all those documents were basic for that research and for that need. And actually, I realized that when people read my book, which is really a very short essay, they say that in any way, it's going to bring them to go to Jung uh, books as well, you know. So I think it's like giving a chance both to Jung, psychology, concepts, to emerge again to the, to the conscious, you know? Because in a way, uh, 50 years has gone by, hold 50 years since uh, Jung's death, exactly, you know? In, in, mm -hmm. uh, if I celebrate, yes. So I think that in a way, all this means that it took, ne the necessity was that it had to take that time. I think Mary, we have to respect that. Mary and Tom mm -hmm. commented, it is what Jung called Kairos, or the right moment in time. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So it's something that is inevitable and probably that we don't know yet uh, the purpose of that. I think it's going to come, you know. I think the Red Book has been such a, a successful uh, book and um, I would hope that Emma book, Emma Young book will have the same uh, reader readership because uh, it's important even for our generation, I think, and that's why I want to speak about that. It's very difficult for me to share all that, to speak about the, the place that Emma Young accepted to occupy as a woman, as a wife, as a, as a mother, you know. Many people tell me it's outdated. I'm not sure it's outdated. And that, that's why I think that many of those values that Emma Jung carried were so fundamental that we have, we consider today that they are old fashioned, but I'm not sure they are old fashioned. I think it's like we have to return to discover the deep meaning of this value, how they carry the meaning of our life, how they help us deal with our life circumstances. And I'm sure that if the Jung family is so big today, after four generations, almost fifth generation, it really means that the life, the life of this couple was really very important, their quality, or else it would have created more jams or dramatic situation than it has. I think, uh, in a way, it was a very comfortable life. The couple had a very comfortable life. I heard that from Helen, Hillil, 
they said they get along very well together, you know, uh, as a family. And Carl was a very good father, but he also was a, a Odysseus, you know. So mm -hmm. he had those many aspects in his personality. And I think Emma, being so intelligent, so sensitive, was probably able to handle all that. Probably not another woman would have been able to handle all that. That's probably the reason why Jung said, made that statement when she was 16 years old, that she would become his wife. Can you imagine where it came from, from the depth of his own unconscious, that he discovered the power of this woman in being able to hold him in a way, you know, and to keep him grounded. I think she kept him grounded, which is very important too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, you know, I realized yeah. that maybe, uh, exploring the way I did the processes, it seemed to me that it was important to stress the fact that everything that came from the first reading of the book biography till today when the book is present in Chiron, that everything has been set up by Emma in a way I didn't do a thing. Of course, I set my beacons, as I said, but I think that it was really Emma's will to do it. And I know, because I had a confirmation, that she was satisfied with the outcome. Like, if she did need that to finish her travel in the other world, which might seem strange to say, but I know it can be true. Huh. Wow. What was the confirmation? Did I ask what the confirmation that came to you it was with that? Well, I had different confirmation. Actually, I can say today, even though I can say it publicly, I finally went to see a very respectful medium. Mm -hmm. But you had medium, uh, medium, medium Nick uh, Stalin, you know, who is very famous. Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, you know, I need to have a confirmation that I did a good job. And I asked her an appointment on the phone, and she said, when you say the name, I see the woman already. Hmm. I said, am I you? And she said, I see him. I see her. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So I had an, an hour appointment, and she told me many things that I will never reveal. But she said, I want to thank you, because you did for me the best thing that was necessary for me. So she said, may I call you my friend? Mm. <laughs> Can you yeah. imagine? Yes. Mm -hmm. She was at that time 100 and how many years, you know? Yeah, and right. And was this little scribe writing for her. Mm -hmm. So I think that somehow she had been suffering so much that the suffering was not appeased after so many years and that it took 40 years to appease her suffering. That sounds so dramatic, you know, that she mm -hmm. couldn't find her, the peace in the other world without appeasing this, this situation and making it public. Wow. Mm -hmm. It goes back to the question of why, why now, why the biographies come out now, why the Red Book, and perhaps there is a healing process that takes decades you know, to really work its way through. And how delightful that you've been a part of that. That is really right. a privilege and an honor for you to be a part, I can imagine, of that. But, you know, it's, in a way, it's extremely sobering. because, And that's why it's so difficult for me to talk about it sometimes. Because I have the, the feeling that I was really a tool, you know. Mm -hmm. She used me as a tool, and I accepted to do it, which was not obvious at all. That's why I need so be those beacons, you know, to check out was I doing right? Was it the right way to do it? And then she kept dreaming and she kept being so close to me that I could sometimes feel her arm on my shoulder. It's very impressive experience, you know. It's almost a mystical experience mm -hmm. somehow. And I dare say that I lived it because some people might say, you know, where does it come from? But that's the way it took, the, that's the way it happened. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Uh, so. <laughs> <laughs> wow. By the way, I want to thank Mariana Tauber for her comments with that. 
she is a Chiron author as well. In 2012, you know, she did a marvelous you know book called The Soul's Ministration. Our website, you know, talks about that. Yes, and yes. Yeah, there's an amazing ability to to write and and draw. There's some paintings in there that are just really spectacular. Exactly. And really appreciate Chiron authors as they you know participate in these. It helps bring life and energy into us as well with that. Exactly, exactly. But you know, on the other webinar, because I will have another webinar, I will really go into on a symbolic way approach Emma Jung's experience because I think it's very, very interesting to bring it to the collective unconscious then because it's only her own experience, but I, I think it can be used on a much broader way. So that's why the second webinar should uh, be centered around that. But I felt that the story of the process had to be explained because it was so mysterious from the beginning to the very end. Mm -hmm. And that so many synchronicities took place that uh, you know, there she was. And I can tell you that the day my book was being published, uh, Carl Gustav Jung was not satisfied. He was not happy at all. I know that because I had dreams and he, was, he wasn't he satisfied. It's very strange to say. Huh. But the way it, it, it manifests itself. Mm. And I think that for him, it's still something that he ha maybe hasn't finished mm. uh, working, you know, right. because we all know that we, Jung said, what you have not done on the earth, you will do it on the other world. Do you remember he said that after his heart attack? Uh -huh. So I think the people who have not finished here will have to finish for, to finish it on the other side, so we better do it today and now, you know. There's a powerful well, thought. I feel like Jung could live because her individuation process was accomplished. Huh, uh-huh. Uh -huh. Wow. And yeah, that's that. a very powerful thought and speaks to each one of us as well, of course, also. You know, what are we called to develop into and individuate and in what ways? And seeing these two luminary features, Emma and Carl Jung, you know, really motivates and inspires us to look at ourselves, too, and where we are at with that. I guess so. I guess so. I guess so. It is uh, very you. interesting. And I think you know that the, the loneliness or the solitude of Emma is something that is also very important to uh, tell today because I think that people nowadays have a very hard time being alone, you know, being mm -hmm. in a solitude. And I think that in a way, that's probably the only way <laughs> we can approach oneself. It's in the solitude, you know. Mm -hmm. And in a way, it was um, Emma's fate throughout her life of deep solitude. Mm -hmm. When she says that she could not confide in anyone, that she was really all by herself, she mm -hmm. had no one she could share whatever she felt inside, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that in a way, going back to the wilderness, like uh, somebody said in one of the webinars that it's important for each and one of us to go back to the wilderness and discover there the deep part of our being, you know, and of ourself. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. uh, it's a time where we have to do that. And I, we know that Jung was enjoyed the wilderness. Uh, the Bollingen Tower for him was where he could be with himself, you know, with his own self. And I think Emma was a very solitary person too. She was not a group person. She was very introvert and she was not inclined to be in group, but she did it. She did what she had to do it, but it was not her, her privileged situation. She yeah. was a loner somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, gosh, well, thank you so much. I'm aware of the time that we ought to wind down in a moment. It has been so delightful, Imelda, to have you on today, our first ever broadcast in France, and it's been marvelous to just see and okay. hear. And there's a book, your book. I, that. I hope that many people read the book because I know it's easy reading and it's worthwhile reading, I think, from what I hear at least and from what yeah. I, I read. Yep. Okay. We'll look forward to the next seminar coming up and Ryan will be broadcasting announcements of that in the time to come. And we'll look forward to connecting again with you. So again, thank you so much. I really, really appreciate your time today. It's been a delightful seminar. 
Good. Okay. Thank you sign. both to you. Thank you yeah. both to you. It's All not right. very easy to experiment this tool, but I'll be better the second time, I hope. <laughs> you are marvelous. <laughs> what an experience. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think it's because we made a mistake. So is it over now? Yeah, yeah. Ryan's going to push the button, and we will say goodbye. <laughs> Yeah, okay. Goodbye, everyone. We'll see you next time. Okay. Thanks to you. And uh, I don't know. And I'm glad <laughs> to have had uh, invisible company. I know. I hope that this invisible company yeah, was marvelous right with the webinar, which is not sure, though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that worked very well. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. We'll talk to everybody soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Yep.